Oh, Lord, now we have to be good. The recording's on. <laughs> <laughs> now we fill it back up again. Anybody? Okay. Oh. There's Paula. I'm so excited Here. to see you guys. It's you good know, to when, see you, too. When Paula joined the TSA, they told her she was the youngest member ever. I think she maybe still is, too. Is I don't cool? think I am now. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Hello. And I am Trudy Hansen retired. So now I'm teaching the storytelling class and I have students that I've told them they need to do this instead of buy the book. So hopefully they will get their registration in and we'll have some young students. Great. Excellent. I will manipulate. I'm not I'm not as nice as Trudy. Shameless. Shameless <laughs> manipulation. <laughs> For sure. This is interesting. You see different face than at other trainings. Well, the fun people are here, Valerie. This is the <laughs> class for the fun people. Look, there's Darcy too. She's shaking her head. Uh -huh. Almost didn't recognize you in normal clothing. That's uh, <laughs> which is not to say that I've seen you out of normal clothing. What I mean is, of course, you wear costumes. So. You've never seen me in clothes before, huh, Larry? That's right. I've never seen you in clothing before. How about that? <laughs> that is not right. <laughs> Yeah, this Isn't was just hard. Oh, look at that boy. This is uh, this is a fine crowd. Look at those faces. Mm -hmm. My word. So, Larry, you must be on the gallery viewpoint. Yes. 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 Seeing yes. everybody. So uh, there, we have we have choices. Uh, we can have the gallery or the speaker. Thing. If I'm, I'm probably the least capable uh, tech person among us, but I take instruction fairly well. And I'm told that if you go up to the right hand corner of your screen, it will say view. You can click on that and you can choose gallery or speaker. So for, for your elucidation, there you go. I know I sprung that word on you, didn't I, Larry? Wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> this is it it's always the same at at one of these you you find yourself as 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 being the old country boy surrounded by educated people <laughs> tossing out big words you said elucidated i did say that <laughs> yeah. huh. I, uh, for some reason i think your your microphone cut out when it said elude and all we heard was sedated <laughs> well, I just wanted to confirm for everyone who may not have heard that that the word was elucidated. Let's let's get all the syllables in there. Yes, yes. that's right. It, it's a what what is it? Syllables. You got to accent the the proper syllable. How does that phrase go? You know what I'm talking about. I okay. do. I can't remember what it is though. I got long. I got long COVID, so my memory sometimes just flies out the window. Not a good place for a storyteller in front of a bunch of <laughs> kindergartners. Who am I? What am I doing here? Okay, we're going to we're going to shut ourselves down and uh, if everybody will mute, we have a little video for you uh, after which we'll launch into this workshop. Oh yes, Larry has his mute button on.
Well, thank you tech people for the wonderful uh, video intro and for some of those witty kinds of uh, slogans. And I wanna welcome everybody. I, we, we've been told that about 130 people or so are signed up for uh, for this workshop and it's uh, pretty remarkable to think that that many people really want to learn how to be good liars and you did notice I hope that this is not um, a workshop for people who want to go into politics we're just we're just talking about the kind of lying that's for fun and not much profit and uh let me introduce the three of us who will be doing a good bit of the talking early on. And then we want to invite you to certainly comment and, and have questions and, and what have you toward the end. Uh, we've got, my, my name's Donna Ingham and I'm uh, a storyteller who has the dubious distinction of having won the Texas State Liars Contest four times, but, I have been outdone by DC Cornish, who has won the Texas State Liars Contest five times. And I have vied on several occasions with Mr. Larry Thompson, who is also a statewide liar and who is the reigning champion of the Kendall County Liars Contest two times in a row, as I remember, Larry. And he will be, I suppose, defending his title uh, next month uh, in Bernie, Texas. Uh, so those are our credentials such as they are. And Larry is the one who uh, is gonna kind of get us organized because he came up with the not quite 10 commandments of being a good liar. So uh, have at it, Larry. Oh. <laughs> I always like to act like I'm on mute. Makes people crazy. Thank you, Donna. And, and uh, Donna is uh, the adult in the room for us today. She'll be leading the charge with us. And and uh, we do, of course, we have the the stellar team from, from TSA uh, yeah. uh, assisting us. There's Vivica there, and we've got uh, David helping us with tech support and Dean. And, and we're, we're going to have a good old time. But I wanted to start with a, a passage from the the uh, the book of Do the Wrong to Me, uh, and and this is an old passage. This is verse seven of 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 the second book, and and I'm I'm quoting here. It says, "And it came to pass in the land of Lore that Amos did come down." from the Mount Pilot truck stop at exit 604 on Interstate 10 with 13 commandments written in grease pencil in the inside flap of a pizza box. And Amos did to deliver those commandments to the people and they found it good. But lo verily as chaos arose, the commandments became only nine. And yet it was good. And the people found it good. And Amos quoted those commandments down to the people. The commandment in the first, thou shalt create a new tale and give life unto it. And the commandment two, thou shalt begin with the truth and need it and need it. And commandment three, thou shalt be no other lies more believable than this lie. And commandment for thou shalt steal from thou's own life. Commandment five, make no story without hyperbole and exaggeration. And commandment number six, honor the lessons of good performing and keep them always. Commandment seven, thou shalt perform always with an air of truthfulness. Commandment eight, thou shalt not murder the fun. And finally, the last surviving commandment, 
makest thou not to live in excess of the time rule. So says Amos in the book of do, do, do no wrong to me. Thank you, Larry. We'll, uh, we'll have to examine those one at a time and study them. Study. Uh, so the first one, thou shalt create a new tale and give life unto it, suggests what we sometimes call the creative process coming up with a plot. I'm going to do, I'm going to sound English teachery here when we talk about plot. Plots always have some degree of conflict, a problem that has to be solved, a goal that has to be reached. Uh, and usually there's some kind of setting. So maybe that's a, a good place for us to start. And I want to, I want to go to you, DC, because I, you, you tell me that, that you, you have three kinds of stories or, or, or categories, I guess, of stories that you draw from. So explain those for starters, will you? Okay. Um, the stories, you have stories I call the twist of the night. I got that, believe that, I stole that from Mickey Spillane and his mistress. He had a whole book called Twist of the Night Tales. I took it from a murder mystery and put it into my storytelling. And that's where everything is going fine until all of a sudden something goes horribly wrong. I have a story I share, it's called A Bad Little Boy. You can actually find it on my YouTube channel. And everything is going fine. It's a normal story about a little boy and he gets into trouble and his mom chews him out and he says, mama, I promise no matter what you say, if you ever need me, just holler help and I'm coming. And then it was a Saturday morning, nothing was going wrong. He was downstairs playing with his toys. His mama was upstairs and his sisters were hanging out with his friend, with a friend. And you know what happened? All of a sudden he heard, help, help. He ran up the stairs, opened the door and that was his mama. She was being kidnapped by two ninjas. Twist the knife. You twist the knife. All of a sudden the wheels that come off, we in a whole different world. And a lot of people was like, oh my God. He's, I can't believe he said that, ninjas. While they're still trying to absorb that, you've moved the story along. you move the story along. And so now they're running behind you trying to catch up with what's going on. And believe me, the closer they get to where you are, the more fun they're having. And that's one I call the twist of the knife. The other one is a classic. It's been used in television for years. It's the fish out of water. Now, most uh, simplest example of the story I'll give you about the fish out of water would be the Beverly Hill business. Complete, total fish out of water. And it works the other way around, Green Acres. Sophisticated city folk in the country. Country folk in the, a new environment, the city. So you have the fish out of water tales. And uh, that story that Larry talked about that I do, with the uh, Chuck Norris is a classic fish out of water. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then the last one I call instinctive. And the instinctive stories are things that you see every day and you take for granted, but every now and then you'll see something and go, you know what? I wish they'd have said that to me because I had a yada, yada, yada. So take that thought and put it in a story actually tell the story which you doing what you thought you would have loved to have been able to do. You know, it's like the, uh, there's a story that in my community about the guy that was pulled over by, by a cop and the cop come up and he started saying, yada, 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 yada. The next thing you know, he grabbed it, started hitting with it, and then he let him along, then he went to grab the other guy. And he said, man, why are you hitting me with that stick? He said, cause I know when you get down the road, you gonna tell him I wouldn't have let him do that to me. So, you know, those kind of, th and, and so those kind of things, you see people get pulled over all the time and you think to yourself, what would have happened if? Make a note of it and come back to it later and be creative with it. Like you said, what is it? Uh, need the truth? You know, <laughs> you, believe it or not, getting pulled over by a cop is the truth. So now you're working it. 
It's like Larry said, you need the truth. And then out of it will come a smile or some really good cinnamon rolls. <laughs> okay, those are, those are good uh, illustrations too, DC. Thank you for, for those. Uh, Larry, how about you? Do you have a, a formula of any sort or categories of stories? I think I'm going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> That's, there's my answer. There it uh, is. But, but I know you're going to say expound on that some, and so I'll expound a bit. I think the, the, for me, it always starts uh, with the, the, the end of the story. Mm -hmm. these, these things I usually start at the end and work backwards and build, mm -hmm. the, build the plot off of uh, the, the, the foundation. I have to keep that thread that this is the place I want to get to at the end and this is going to be my, my, my focus point and everything builds to that. Um, we had a story in, in uh, George West a few years ago that was solving the, the famous, uh, why did the chicken cross the road and which came first, the chicken or the egg? And so oh, those became the, the goals was making sure that everything built up to that point so that in the very end, I could say that, you know, that was, that was my hook. And this is, why the chicken crossed the road and which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, in other cases, uh, the one with, with um, the Cadillacs out in West Texas, that, that's a different type of story. That's how this thing came to be. We all know there are, are, are a ton of folk tales of why is the sky blue? Why does the moon follow the sun? Uh, why does the tiger have stripes? And so with a good with a good uh, untrue tale, like we're talking about here, you can create the reason for this thing that people know exactly what it is already, but you're gonna tell them the real reason why. So, so you can have those sorts of stories as well. Uh, in, from, from DC's point about uh, the ninjas, you know, his story didn't have the purpose of that story wasn't to talk about ninjas, but that was how he got from point A to point B and how he illustrated how important it was that his mama needed help. That boy's mama needed help. It was ninjas after him. <laughs> uh, but those, those types, I think the types of stories that, that go into lies like this are the exact same types of stories that everybody is going to use anyway. If you're a folktale teller, then you're building your own folktale style story that's completely made up. And guess mm -hmm. what? Most of them folktales was made up too by somebody years ago. Don't tell anybody I told you that. I'm glad you mentioned folktales, Larry, because that's, if, if there are patterns to follow, Aside from, I'm glad you mentioned beginning, middle, and end too, because that's that's the structure of a typical narrative. And I read an art. There's an article I have it here beside me. As a matter of fact, that Bill Lepp, noted liar from West Virginia, wrote for Storytelling Magazine, and he says he starts in the middle, the, where where the absurdity starts, and then he works backwards to some semi-logical way to get there. He's, he's illustrating with his famous story about Buck Dog and, uh, but he was really trying to get to how his tongue got stuck to the freight train. Right. So by following the dog, who's following a, a bullet, I think, as I remember. So the first part is sort of believable. That's gonna be our next commandment. Uh, and, and then the real stretch, the real exaggeration is in the middle. And then he has to figure out a way to get out of it. Um, so yeah, so beginning, middle and end, it, it rarely does a story come in that order. I mean, it, it usually starts in the middle or the end, as you said, 
Larry, but here, anyway, a pattern, you mentioned folk tales. When I first got seduced into telling lies, uh, I happened to cross a collection of stories from uh, the Ozarks in which there was a story about a woman who went out uh, to get a pumpkin to bake a pumpkin pie and she found a really big pumpkin. And in the course of the story, folk tale, she gets stuck inside the pumpkin. That became the basis for my first winning live about a watermelon uh, in which my stepmother gets inside. I may tell that in a minute. We're each gonna, I think, tell one story and then see how they, uh, they illustrate some of these points. Um, so that for, for a beginner, as I was, not, not setting out to be a liar in my lifetime, uh, I used that pattern to, to establish actually a couple of stories uh, before I started following some more of Larry of uh, DC's things about just look around and see what's happening and and there therein lies a story. So um, any other, any other comments about the actual creation the process from either of you before we move to number two? I think we might also just say that these are good. Uh, th these you, you may be putting this story together if you're entering a contest, but it's also going to become a story that you can use right. uh, further down the line in your in your telling adventures. Uh, that, and when we when we're accenting creating a new tale, I think well, there's there are some some contests that tell you to, to, to actually make sure you have a new story you've never told before. Uh, right. but, but even if you're not gonna be in a contest, just the idea of sitting down and crafting one, two, three, four, six stories every year is a great practice. And there's no reason at all why one of them can't be something like this that's, that has a, comes from a place that's completely outside your comfort zone perhaps, or or outside your uh, the history of the other stories that you told. Mm -hmm. Well, and DC made the point when we were just visiting back and forth, it, exactly that, that it becomes part of your repertoire. It's not just for, for contests and whatever. In fact, a lot of people I'm sure don't even want to enter a contest, but they might want to come up with a, with a stretched story. Well, they don't uh, want to enter a contest against y'all because, you know, I can attest to the fact that I have more second place finishes than anyone else in the state. Uh, and, and like as not, it's to one of those two. Ooh, I'm sending you the evil eye right now. Ooh. I'm still chasing you and Bernie. Well, one of these days, you know, you'll, you'll crack on something. <laughs> Yeah. It's I well I used to say it was a friendly competition, but then DC said no, it's not. So, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, well we'll move on. We can always come back to this if need be. Do you got your hand up, DC? Well, I was just gonna say your creative process begins for me with, with once you understand story patterns, you'll start seeing stories in everything you do. You'll go to the movies and you'll start seeing the story develop. You're just so your powers of observation and the inherent learning of the patterns and stories will start to just reveal things to you. You'll start seeing things everywhere at the gas station, and all that kind of thing. And my style developed with, well, we'll talk about that later. I think she said we're going to talk about that later. Yeah, it may be a later commandment. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we'll, I'll get to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Larry, for putting that in. If any of you in the, in, uh, the attendee slots want to chime in on this, we have the chat room and we're, we're watching it. So uh, by all means, jump in if you, if you think it's something or have a question. Uh, we're gonna, we'll move on for the moment to number two, which is thou shalt begin with the truth and need it. That's K-N-E-A-D, need it. So I'm going to interject my story here uh, because I use it as an illustration for that exact point. 
that you start with the truth and then you stretch it. Many of you I know have heard this story because I've been telling it for years and it is the one that I uh, patterned after that Ozark folktale about the woman who went out to get a pumpkin and she wound up getting stuck inside of it. And, um, so I thought, well, I could do something like that, but I wasn't familiar with, uh, you always want to write about things you know, you told that uh, you know, at the beginning of any writing uh, challenge. Well, I didn't know anything about pumpkins, but my daddy raised watermelons. And so then that took me back to the farm that he lived, uh, that he had out south of Brownfield, Texas, up there in, in Terry County. Uh, and and this this began, so, th so it begins with the truth. I, I mean, you're going to figure out where the stretching starts, but but my daddy, like I said, had this farm out south of Brownfield, and he and he and he raised things. He grew things. He liked to grow things. He he had cattle. He had horses. He had bird dogs. He had goats. He had guinea fowl. He had chickens. You name it, he'd try it. But but it was a farm, right? So he also had crops. He planted cotton out on the back forty. He had alfalfa down in the draw, and every year, every year he had a, a big garden. Now, up by the house, he would plant tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, but out in the field, he'd plant quarter-mile rows of field corn, black-eyed peas, string beans. That was in the spring. In the fall, he planted turnips. Well, every year, my daddy got his picture in the Brownfield News and Terry County Herald holding the longest cucumber and the biggest turnip. Well, then one year in spring, he decided he's going to plant watermelons and, and not just any watermelons, he's going to plant them in between the corn rows. No, sir, he's going to plant black diamond watermelons. Now, you may or may not know about black diamond watermelons. They are not your long, skinny, stripedy kind of watermelons, and they are certainly not those little bitty personal size watermelons you can get these days at the grocery store. No, 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 they, they are those great, big, dark, green watermelons ruby red on the inside, big hearted watermelon. Oh, they are good. Well, now your black diamonds grow big anyway, but this one particular melon got to growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger till pretty soon it was pushing out beyond those corn rows. It uprooted about a quarter acre or so. Well, he got too big for daddy to load in the back of the pickup, take it into town and get his picture made with it. So he just called the editors of the newspaper and he said, you're going to have to come out here this year, fellas. I got something you got to see. Well, they did. So there stood my daddy with his hand up on that watermelon. Oh, I mean, it was way bigger than he was. My daddy was five foot nine with his boots off. Well, then my stepmother got to thinking about what it was she wanted to take to the county fair that year in the way of canned goods. Now, she didn't enter the baked goods, but she did love to can. And she had a real good recipe for watermelon preserves. So she decided to go up to the field, look over the crop of those watermelons. Well, she, she had a, an eight-inch butcher knife with her. And she went up there and she said to herself, I wonder if that melon is any good. Because she looked, of course, to that one that Daddy had had his picture made with. She said, I reckon I'd better plug it and find out. So she used that big old eight inch butch and I she went over there and started cutting out one of those triangle shaped plugs. But I'm telling you now, the rind on that melon was so thick that when she pulled that plug out, well, it was all rind. There wasn't any watermelon meat on it. Well, that provoked her some. So she started whacking away at that plug hole and it got bigger, it got bigger, it got bigger, it got bigger. Finally, it was big enough she could step inside, aiming to get to the heart of that watermelon. You know, I think everything would have been all right if there hadn't been just a little slope to that field, but there already being some strain on that watermelon vine, what with that big old melon on it. When my stepmother added her weight to it, it was just too much for that little old stem and it just popped right off. And the next thing she knew, she was just rolling head over heels, over head, over he inside the watermelon. 
Well, that melon rolled on down out of that cornfield, took out about a half a mile of fence post, finally wound up over on the county road. And she was on her way to town. Well, Daddy was outside when he looked up and he saw this melon rolling down the road. And then he could hear his wife's voice coming from inside. She was hollering, the heart, the heart. And he thought she was having a heart attack. So he jumped into the pickup, pushing the case of cannon jars he'd bought that morning at the Piggly Wiggly over to one side, got in behind the melon. Well, that county road made kind of a little bang and turn there as it came into town, and it just kind of kicked that melon right on over onto Highway 82, and she was on her way to Lubbock by way of Meadow, Ropesville, and Wolferth. Well, that melon was just rolling down that highway. It was forcing cars and pickups and 18-wheelers off into the bar ditch. It was mowing down mailboxes and Burma shave signs, and Daddy was doing his best to keep up. Meanwhile, in behind him now were falling in police cars and ambulances and fire trucks, and there was even one of those traffic helicopters flying overhead. So all Daddy had to do to keep up to the minute reports was just turn on the radio. The runaway melon is approaching Lubbock at a very high rate of speed. It is headed right toward the South Plains Fairgrounds. They've evacuated the Midway and the exhibits area is on high alert. Well, fortunately for everybody concerned, as the highway goes through Lubbock there, it makes a gentle little curve. And the melon didn't quite negotiate that curve and it just kind of bounced right on over, right into the middle of McKenzie Park, actually right in the middle of Prairie Dog Town. And no animals were hurt in this part of the story. And that melon just started rolling across all those little prairie dog towns and they must have uh, prairie dog mounds and they must have acted just like, well, so many speed bumps because they sure enough did slow that melon down. So that by the time it rolled on over onto the South Plains Fairgrounds, it just rolled up and stopped just as docile as you please, right in front of the food exhibits building. Well, daddy came screeching around the corner in his pickup, still thinking she was having a heart attack, bailed out, said, are you all right, sweet thing? Do you need CPR? Well, she came crawling out of that melon all red in the face and spitting seeds. She said, no, I'm all right. I just wish I had my cannon jars because I don't think I'm going to have time now to get my preserves made. Daddy said, not to worry, I got a whole case of jars right here in the pickup. All you need to do is scoop out some of the heart of that melon, stir it up in those jars. Don't even need to add sugar. You know how sweet those black diamonds are. Put a cap on it, you're going to win a blue ribbon for sure. Well, she pulled herself up to her full height, brushed herself off as best she could, did exactly what he said to do. And by doggies, she did win another blue ribbon. And you know, I think the melon would have won a blue ribbon too if it hadn't had so many miles on it. <laughs> okay, so. You need to quit lying. You need to quit lying. <laughs> <clears throat> so the first part of that story is all true. My dad really did have that farm. He really did raise all those crops. He really did love getting his picture in the paper and he really would take any uh, odd size, oversized fruit or vegetable down, get his picture made with it clip it out of the paper, send it to me wherever I was. Uh, so the, it, the first part of that story is all absolutely true. My stepmother hated to cook, loved to can. She'd been a nurse. I always thought she just liked to sterilize things. And so I just took those people and posed them on that old folk motif about giant fruits and vegetables, and then had to figure out how to carry it to the end. Uh, and, and only thought of later that idea about saying that the melon might have won two if it hadn't had so many miles on it. So you, you add to them from time to time when you, when you get a chance. Uh, so that the advantage of, of, of that, and then I'm going to turn it over to you other two, is that I don't have to remember anything because I can visualize. You know, they say the best way to learn to tell a story is to visualize it not memorize it. I can visualize all that stuff. I've been there. I know that farm. I know all of those 
uh, I know the draw. I know where daddy planted everything. I know that county road into town. I know the road to Lubbock. I know McKenzie Park and Prairie Dog Town, which is a major tourist attraction in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, so, and it helps the listener visualize it too. Uh, if they can see the same things you are. So that's my crusade for start with the truth and then stretch it. So what, what say you, gentlemen? Well, I, I, I think, go ahead, DC. I think, I think you got something on the tip of your tongue right there. I can almost see it. <laughs> I was trying to say if you go ahead, but okay. Um, find the truth and need it. I don't think that's it. Uh, but what, let me tell you why I believe that. Because it all for me, it all started one day I was driving home. Now I was driving home when I pulled in the driveway, where I pull into the driveway, I can look down and I can see them trash cans they give it if they put on the side of the road, the machine come by, grab that thing, throw it over in the trash. You know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all know, okay. Well, I look over, what do I see sitting on the top of the trash can but a cat? I see the cat, so I blow the horn. The wife come out and see me blowing at the cat. She's like, baby, leave that cat alone. I say, we don't need no strays around this house. You, we don't need no stray. Oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. She gets, I said, don't give him a deed. He's going to keep, he's going to stay around here forever. But she did it. I said, okay, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. I left it alone. I left it alone. And man, I left it alone, and I tell you, a couple of days later, I drive back home. When I drive back home, I look up at who laying on the front porch by the door with the cat. Meow. I'm like, get away, get away from here. Get out of here. I chase him out the yard. I don't think nothing of it until the next day. I drive home. I come home. I come home. This time I look, and I don't see the cat. I open the door, and I come in, and I say, baby, uh, fix me a sandwich. She said, well, we ain't got nothing for the sandwich. I said, what happened to my tuna? Oh, you mean that can of white albacore tuna that you had put the eggs and the pickles and the onion and the mayonnaise in? And the, I said, yeah, yeah, my, my, my tuna, where is it? I gave it to the cat. I looked over the cat laying there and he looked it up at me and me, I'm like, you done gone. I told you to leave this cat alone. Well, I tried not to pay no attention to the wife was getting attached to the cat. And so one day I come in and the, I walked in the house and the cat was sitting in my chair, my chair. I mean, ABC World News tonight was coming on. That's my seat. You and my, you got to go. You got to go. So I look around, I don't see the wife. I grab the cat and I walk outside and walk a couple of blocks down and I throw the cat in the Make it a lot. I come back home. I don't see the cat no more till the next day. I come in, and this time when I come in, I come in and I'm like, I don't see that cat. Where is that cat? I look up, and man, the cat is laying in my bed. I'm like, what? Oh, no, 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 no. So I grab the cat. This time I jump in the car, drive a couple streets over, throw the cat out. Well, I throw the cat out in the park, drive home. So I don't think nothing of it. But this time I come home, I don't see the cat, and I'm thinking, well, I ain't seen the cat in a couple of days. I come home this time and I look up, and the cat, I say, baby, I left my fried chicken. I had some fried chicken. Cold fried chicken is the best fried chicken in the world. If you ain't had no cold fried chicken, go buy some hot chicken, put it in the refrigerator. I'm telling you, cold fried chicken is the best. And man, I go and I go to get my cold fried chicken and I look over there with his head, with his head neck deep in the box was the cat eating my cold fried chicken. No, you done gone too far. You done ate my chicken now. I'm gonna tell you something. You wanna violate a brother's space, eat his fried chicken. I'm telling you, I grabbed that cat. I tied the cat up, put a blindfold on it, throwed it in the bag, got in the car, throwed him in the back seat, drove. 
I drove on the freeway, drove down the freeway. I turned to the east. I turned to the west. I turned to the north. I turned to the south. I pulled down a one-way dead end street, made three or four turns off of that one. And by the time I got to the corner of that dead end street, there was black dog. I stopped the car, turned out all the lights. I reached in the back and grabbed the sack, and the cat was gone. <clears throat> The cat was gone. I jumped up, looked around, grabbed my phone, dialed Rose's number. She answered the phone, hello? I said, baby? She said, yeah. Tell me something. Have you seen the cat? She said, yeah, he's sitting right here. I said, put him on the phone because I'm lost. <clears throat> now, see. I'm, I'm going to leave that alone, too, right there. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to tell Larry, your turn. That, that's just, now, I want y'all to think now <laughs> of those two stories that you just heard right there. Both Donna and D.C. were very precise on some, some places in that story. Donna mentioned Piggly Wiggly. She mentioned the highway markers for that area. DC said, I got on the freeway. I went down. It was a dead end. I took left, right, left, right. He said the ABC News was coming on and he needed his chair. The stories that you're creating from, from what you're hearing in this workshop are going to be some of the most detailed stories that you're going to build. And you're going to use those details that come from your own experience to help mm -hmm. you remember that story and get that story out in the right direction. If you're going to tell a, a folk tale about the creation of the earth, it's going to be usually in a general term and there'll be scenery and things like that. But these stories are going to have some of the, the most important details that you're going to want to get out. I, as soon as he starts telling that story about pulling in and hitting the driveway and seeing those trash cans. He spent more time talking about those trash cans than you probably would have if the point of the story was going in the house to say hey to his wife, but it wasn't. The point of that story is there's a cat on top of these trash cans. I have to make sure that you see those trash cans in your head. That is a true thing. We can all relate to that somewhere in your house you've got trash cans and you put them out by the road or you take them to the dump, but you're dealing with those trash cans. These stories start with some piece of truth. Donna has a lot of buildup about how that farm looks. She wants you to picture that farm. She wants you to see those rows of corn and then imagine those watermelon between those rows of corn. And then it comes back later when that watermelon gets so big that it moves those rows of corn to the side. You already have that in your head. These details like this are going to be super important to include in a story you're going to do for a contest or a story you're going to do that's just going to be a just a straight up made up tale that you're going to tell. And the needing that you do to stretch out that distance. Now, I if we was in person, I'd say, now raise your hand if you really think DC took that cat and dumped it in the park. You know that's not true. It's a made up tale right when you hear that. But he's got to get you, he's got to hook you in to say, this cat is having trouble. He's got to need that story out. Three, four, five different ways that cat has offended him and caused him to drive across town in the middle of the night. That, that starting with the truth and kneading it out is, is how you're going to get successful. And then finally, he gets to the end, put the cat on the phone, I'm lost. <laughs> and and you're, you're laughing at that just because of how preposterous it is. But then you're like, well, wait a minute, the cat made it home somehow. Maybe he does know where I am. Your brain's going to just, it's going to check out for a second. Start with the truth and then knead it. That's uh that's the way to do it. That's that's exactly the way to do it. Heck yeah. 
right. Well, that you're the teacher among us, Larry. That was wonderfully uh, uh, explained. And and uh, somebody has. I pulled out the uh, Bell Lab article, but somebody's already beat me to it. Uh, it's available. <clears throat> Katie says uh, in the archives of uh, Storytelling uh, Magazine, uh, and it is. It's called Crafting Tall Tales with a subtitle story, Buck Ain't No Ordinary Dog. Uh, and, I, and I'll, well, since I have it in my hand, I'll quote what uh, Bill says about uh, believability, because that's our next one, which is gonna feed off of the one that we just uh, uh, talked about. There shall be no other lies more believable than this one. And Bill says, for the tall tale to work, your audience must trust you. And this trust is built via your words and presentations. In my stories, Bill says, I try very hard to give the audience every reason to believe, at least in the beginning. Uh, and uh, so that's that's really basically what we're talking about is, uh, but that idea of developing trust, even though, even though if you go to a contest, you know these people are gonna be telling lies, that's the whole point. Yeah. And, but, and if you if you know Bill, you know he starts off with a handicap anyway because he's only got one L in the name Bill. So from there <laughs> on, everything goes out the window. Hey, Gary wanted <laughs> Gary Whitaker wanted to know about that pumpkin story. Where did you find that? That you pumpkin know, I, I'll have to I'll have to email you, Gary, because I've still got it. It's uh, it was a collection of Ozark tales. I remember that. Uh, and it might even be Richard Chase. It's been too long since I, since I, cabbaged onto it. But I'll 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 get through the title. Uh, okay, so do uh, one uh, when you go to if okay those of you who aspire to be competitive liars. Almost all of the judging sheets that I've seen, certainly in Texas, have the same criteria for uh, the judges to mark as they are hearing the, the lies. And one is believability, which sounds, sounds counterproductive, but this is what we've just been talking about. Story craft is another one. That's what we started with, the idea of putting your story together. Uh, <clears throat> originality. Now that that doesn't mean you can't build on some old folk motif, but it needs to be an original approach to it, an adaptation of your very very own. The other two are, which we'll get to in our nine commandments, are presentation skills, uh, and then a fifth one is audience response, uh, which you can't control except by amusing them enough that they're going to laugh. Uh, and I, I'll offer this one little aside. I used to have a little group of friends of mine who would come to the Austin Liars contest, which is where I got my start. Uh, and one of my friends very seriously said, do we need to spread out in the audience so we can make more noise from more directions? I said, no, I don't think that's necessary, but do applaud and stomp your feet. So, um, However much weight that carries with the judges, we don't know. Uh, but uh, anything else we need to say? About, I think we've stressed that point considerably, the whole idea of believability, right? So, uh, and we've kind of touched on this, especially I think uh, you did, DC. Number four is thou should steal from thou's or thy own life. I like thou's actually. Uh, so you've kind of made your initial remarks about it. DC, anything you want to add to that? Okay, and I'm going to quickly turn it over to Larry. It's because part of being a good storyteller, okay, is I'm on my soapbox now, is being observant. Watch what's going on around you. And then as you start to see characters develop, you know, as you start to see characters develop, make a mental note of it. Use that person. Uh, I believe Larry was the one that was saying that 
I too saw in Donna, I saw those people, I saw them. And that made it real to me. That made it real to me. Believe it or not, as a storyteller, your persona and how you approach the stage actually <laughs> If you're confident about your story, that confidence comes through. You know, if you if you really have a good handle and control of your story, it comes through. And so one of the things I found that by looking and studying people, you start to see personality, characteristics, traits, but you also see trends. You see trends, you know, and uh, some things is just just funny. You know, like the old, the old, the old people that both of them forget. They like, well, you forgetting all your life. Yeah, you forget to all life too. You know, yada 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 yada. And he says, well, don't you forget, you know, to fix my eggs and toes. Okay, I ain't going to forget that. Yada, yada yada. Don't forget my eggs and toes. Okay. So she walks in and she comes in. And she says, here's your pancakes. And he looks at it and goes, thank you. And see. Believe it or not, as people get that, you get among older people, you see that. So I made that note in my mind, you know, I made that note in my mind and I actually use that sometimes when I'm putting a older person character together. Because a lot of times when we are putting these people in these stories, they are actually characters that we have created. We've taken a little from this person, a little from this person, then you put them in there, but because they are so familiar to the listener, it's like, I know that person. I know that person. And I like to use characters like that because I was telling Donna earlier, I can tell a folk tale, but I have more fun with what I call first person stories, stories that I gather from what goes on around me, you know? And I think when I'm having fun, the audience is having fun. So I, I, I was just going to add to that and say that you, the, the way it works in my case, when I see something or I hear something or the kids do something or the, the grandkids do something or I see something where, you know, Walmart is, is, is a fine feeding ground for finding these sorts of things. But I will take out my phone and I will text my my wife and I'll just text her the, the most random note ever and she'll get when when it first happened a few times she said what are you talking about but now she knows I'm just she just keeps it and then later on the next day two days three days later I'll say hey where's that thing I texted you and she'll read it back to me and I'll say yeah that's going to be in a, in a story one of these days it just find a way to capture those moments that happen in your own life you know, we're just coming off of uh, off of all this lockdown stuff, and and I I have this this story, the the Mentidoso Ranch, and some of you on the phone may speak Spanish, and Mentidoso is like the liar, you know. But a lot of people just think it's the name of a ranch that's on the next property next to mine, and. And I'll tell you some of that. I'll probably leave out a couple of places in it. But but anyhow, we we use this. I use this story that this is things that come straight out of your life. So so it go. It starts out like this. I'll tell you what. It's been colder than a frosted frog over here at the Honeydew Ranch. And uh, last weekend uh, we got in the truck and headed out to the Mentidoso Ranch. That's uh, that's old Doc Reynolds' place just down the way. Uh, he and his third wife, Crystal, uh, they raise uh, chickens and cattle and, and a little bit of heck now and then, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, you know, things are starting to open up a little bit, but uh, Doc Reynolds invited us over. We, the mass mandate is down around us, so we felt, we felt comfortable heading over to his place and, and uh, have a little backyard soiree. And I figured it'd be a good time to catch up on all the pasture prattle and see what's been happening on his side of the fence. And since uh, Bobby Sue, you know, she hadn't been able to go to her favorite salon uh, these past couple of years. So so we had to fix her up right here on the ranch before we left. And and uh, she said she wanted to 
put some color and some shine on her toes. You you know how women like to do that. And and uh, well, I came out here to the garage and looked around, to see what I could find. I found some bright pink paint that we had used in a wedding a few years back, and and I had a can of that that spray shellac, you know. So I thought that would that would do it. And uh, and uh, well, I I almost had to wrestle her down to to let me do it on her feet. But by what time we we're done, I think she had it fixed up pretty well, and she looked good. And put on those boots, we got our hats on, we jumped in the truck and we headed over to the Mentidoso for for some of Doc Reynolds uh, uh, prize chicken fried steak. You know, he's well known in these parts for his chicken fried steak. And and I tell you what, it felt really good to leave the confines of the Honeydew Ranch for a few hours. And we pulled into the Mentidoso, he's got those big old steel post gates, you know, and we pulled off the main road onto his and I had to hit the brakes so hard it nearly sent Bobby Sue straight through the windshield. We saw this flash, this this kind of reddish color flash just race across in front of us. Uh, we we sat back and and recovered our wits a little bit and uh, uh, well, Bobby Sue said, you know that that looked a little bit like a chicken. And I said, yeah, but I've never seen a chicken run that fast before and. Uh, as it turned out, she weren't wrong. Uh, Doc Reynolds, you may remember, he's a he's an inventor of sorts, and he uh, he he's always waiting for that that big invention that's going to save and 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 set him up for life. You know that one time he went through that waterproofing phase, and he he made waterproof bath towels, and he made uh, waterproof tea bags, uh, uh, waterproof. Uh, a raincoat, you know, it, it, things just don't always work out for him the, the best way. And he ain't rich yet. But anyway, he still starts inventing. But we showed up nonetheless for dinner there. He started telling us that he had made an improvement to his legendary chicken fried steak recipe. He got on to Amazon and he got him some dried sea sponges. I don't know where he got these from, but they're dried sea sponges. And, and he saw them there brown and kind of crumbly. And he decided he was going to mince them all up and put them into the breading for his chicken fried steak. Thought it would give, you know, enhance the palate of, of the taste of this chicken fried steak. And, and so we sat there while the steaks was cooking up and uh, we chatted a bit about what had been happening at the minted doso and how much we both needed rain and how the quarantine was driving us crazy. And then finally, Bobby Sue held up her hand and she said, Doc, I just have to tell you this. We pulled in your ranch in the gate there. And I swear that some, we almost ran over some kind of chicken or something that just raced in front. I said, yeah, that thing was moving faster than gossip in a small town for sure. And and old Doc, he just sat back in his chair, you know, grabbed the suspenders. He said, well, I, I was waiting for the right time to tell you all this. And, and he began to tell us that his ranch there, the Mentidoso, was uh, going through some genetic experiments. And he was the, uh, the, the founder and the formator of uh, something he called the Gaius Octopodus. Uh, and, and we just... Gave herself the sideways look, and he had to explain the Latin. It meant eight-legged chicken, and so he found out he could he could he could genetically modify these chickens to have eight legs, and it was going to save hunger on the planet. Imagine one chicken could feed now six or seven people. You know how that that was just going to be fantastic. And I said, "Well, Doc, uh, I mean, it all sounds good and all, but can you?" I, does, does having eight legs affect the flavor at all? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to have to reserve judgment on that because as it happens, an eight-legged chicken is pretty hard to catch, you know. And, but anyways, <laughs> about that time, the steaks was done, and we, uh, we had ourselves a fine meal. And I've got to tell you, got to be truthful with you all, the, adding those brown sea sponges all ground up and all that, well, they tasted horrible. They tasted horrible, you know, but on the upside, they did hold a lot of gravy on that chicken fried steak, you know, with those sea sponges and all. And well, 
we had ourselves a couple of beverages and had to pop the top button on the jeans, you know, and felt like we had a better head on back to the house. And we started walking back towards the truck. And that's when Bobby Sue, she was limping a little bit. And, and you know, it was hard for her to get up in the truck. She sat down, she pulled off that boot, you know, and we got to looking at her toes and there was definitely something wrong. That, that big toe on the side was all swole up and angry looking. We got home, got out of the truck. I helped her in the house, sat down in front of the computer. She got on WebMD, took a photograph and sent it in. And they, they came right back with an answer. Turns out she is lactose intolerant. Probably had it her entire life. Did, didn't even know it. You know, I, I, one of those things that happens to you as you start to get older, things fall apart. But yeah, she's lactose intolerant. I, I never... Uh, Never had heard of that before, but but anyhow, we're going to get back over to Doc Reynolds here in a week or so, and we'll have some ribs, maybe some brisket, and that's if uh, if it don't rain and if the creek don't rise. Well, if we do get over there, I'll be sure and tell you about it in the next story. Yeah, that, that is true. And <laughs> now, much of that story comes from the truth. Hopefully it's believable. Uh, I can't remember what the next law, uh, the next commandment is. Did it fit into the next commandment? Uh, oh, steal from your own life. So, so that does fit into that. Uh, my my wife is definitely shellactose intolerant. Uh, she went to the salon and and they, they you know, the, the lady sat there and they painted that stuff on and it fell off a couple of days later, you know, didn't last at all. And, uh, uh, and, and we do have, a, uh, well, we don't have a Mentidoso ranch next door, but, but we could, we could have, it's believable out there. Uh, I do have pink paint in the gay rods here though. I can show it to you. Many of those things come straight out of our life. I think that having these stories come from your own life means that Nobody else is going to have the same experience you do, and you feel free to write about it and, and tell people about it. That's, that is the, the, heck, that's the foundation of doing these things. Nobody else is going to tell you anything about the Honeydew Ranch but me. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's a good point I wanted to underscore is that uh, you've, you've used that setting in more than one story, I believe. And, and you can do that. You can establish your own um, mythical place and, uh, and draw on your experiences and, and put them in that, that place. So, so setting can, can be a unique part of it. And then, see, I made a couple of other notes while you were talking and, and what DC had said before, and that is, we have to choose our point of view, whether we're going to tell it in first person or third person about somebody else or involve, you can still be the narrator and, and uh, even take part in a story. Uh, and the uh, characters, I think you mentioned characters, DC. If you are drawing from real life, your own or your relatives, I pick on a lot of my relatives, uh, then you know those people and you can, you can highlight their characteristics, make them caricatures of a sort uh, and, uh, and, and bring life to them for, for, the, uh, for the listener. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> I, I always figured my dad would love being the focus of one of my stories, even if he is sort of playing the fool because he just liked attention. So, so there you go. And I, when I ran out of folklore motifs to borrow from, I, I became more attuned, as you say, DC and you too, Larry, to those around me and the things that were going on. So now I tell a lot of stories about our boy CY and his sweet young thing of a wife, Stephanie Michelle, because they just do bizarre things. And you don't have to exaggerate very much uh, to uh, to build uh, a lie. So, um, I so like that what, I like what DC said about the on, on the characters where you you may 
it may be an amalgamation. That's probably yeah, the absolutely. biggest word I'm going to use today is, well, you know, it's a little you. bit from Steve and it's a little bit from Brian and a little bit from, from Joyce. It's an am amalgamation, but in your head, you 100% need to identify with that person. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're going to get this believable nature. You, you can't, um, it, you know, DC, you have that, that story with, uh, with Walker, Texas Ranger. And, and it's not like he's your, he's your friend and you know him, but it's like you've, you've seen him so much that you can just relate to people how he would approach a situation in that that amalgamation of maybe more than one person, maybe grandma and grandpa together, and forming one person in your mind for the story is is super important. Right. Okay. I, I think we're leading somewhat logically. I'm sorry, DC, go ahead. I was saying, yeah, it, it's it's a fun story to tell. I didn't know I was still muted. I'm glad you said something. Thank you. Oh, got it back to you. All right. So we, we'll move on to number five, which has sort of been, uh, uh, we've got to, I'm, I'm going to expand on it a little bit. The original statement from the Nine Commandments was make no story without hyperbole and exaggeration. And that sort of goes without saying if you're telling a lie. But I, I think we can talk about language, the importance of language in general in the stories. And a couple of things you did, Larry, made me think about it. I, I'm trying to hark back and you, you set up some simile. It was colder than a something. Frog. There you go. So those kinds of sayings, regional, many of them uh, are amusing. And, uh, and they also make a point. So that sort of use of language is, uh, I think, striking. And the other thing is that um, Larry is a poet. Many of you may know that as well as a, a fine uh, prose storyteller, I guess. And he even tells a, a lie, this is one of his winning lies, told it in verse. Uh, if you're talented enough to do that, go for it. It would make me really nervous. But using language and language techniques that make your story stand out, I think, is, uh, is a possibility, too. And we might mention here, many of you, I think, knew him or knew of him, the late Dennis Gaines, one at the Texas State Liar, Liars Contest, I think every year he entered, if he got beat, it was probably by UDC. But anyway, his stories were not stories. They were in the, in the vein of the old tall talk, I would call it, instead of tall tales. The kind of boasting that the cowboys used to do, supposedly, when they'd go into the saloon and they'd say, you know, I'm, I'm a rip roar. I'm, I, I can't even do it, but he did it for seven and a half minutes without stop. And he was a poet too. Uh, brilliant, but a unique kind of, uh, of tale telling that wasn't really a tale so much as it was a, 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 an extended boast um, I think some of his may be on YouTube. I don't know. I just that put sure. uh, I just put a link for for that particular story you're talking about. There's oh, a cool. YouTube page where I think he recorded it maybe at home uh, before going onto the stage to do it. So it, it it's super good. I guess I I would add what you're saying there about like uh, uh, cold and a frosted frog or or uh, move faster than gossip in a small town there's a lot of places right. to find those kind of sayings but i think it's important to 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 make sure that it fits with the overall theme that you're constructing uh and the location mm -hmm. that you're in um you know you for me i 
I've taken on this this voice and the mannerism and and I, I want you to to know that I just got out of the field and I just cleaned the poop off my boot in order to tell you the story. And so things like that, those little phrases are going to fit with that particular story and that particular theme and that particular location, place and time uh, where they wouldn't fit if I were uh, telling a third person type story or if I were telling a story about going down the highway to Mississippi on vacation. You know, there's you you want to pepper those things into your stories when they're appropriate and when they help service the greater theme that you're setting up. I guess if that makes sense. It does. And there are collections specifically of Texas sayings, books full of them yep. uh, that you can find. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, uh, little by little, I'm going to put all nine of the commandments in the chats because we uh, we had thought we might be able to post them all on a shared screen, but we'll do it the the manual way. Uh, so I'll uh, give me, be patient. I'll get it done. Um, okay. Uh, and the other thing that, before we leave language are these similes, metaphors, however you correct, collect them and uh, present them. Again, those are additional ways to be specific, be concrete with the details that we've been talking about, because the more of that you can do, the more memorable your story is going to yep. be, the better you're going to be able to remember it, and the more memorable, it, memorable it'll be for uh, those who hear it. Uh, right. DC, I think DC, you have a couple of places in in some stories that that really go take the hyperbole way up very high, and the exaggeration way up very high. Um, you've got a story about having a dollar bill, something about a dollar bill in your pocket, and and I believe you wind up in space. <laughs> Is that if I got that right? Oh my God, I have told that story. In That's, and, and the thing that always marks a good, a good lie to me is that exaggeration and that, that hyperbole that you, uh, yeah. and, and it can't be gratuitous, you know, I mean, it has to be because when you watch DC do that story and he's, he's, he's flying in a jet but all these other things have happened and the, his momentum, his personal delivery momentum has escalated and escalated and escalated that the, the only place left to be is in the sky, in a plane with another plane flying behind him. And it, it, it's preposterous when you take it out of context, but when you hear it being delivered, it's one thing building these situations, building and building and building and building and building and his delivery building, which moves us almost to number six, but his, his use of that exaggeration and his use of that hyperbole has to be done in, well, in the correct way. It is designed and the term that I use is pace, mm -hmm. pace, that story, it's one of the stories when I'm through, when I finish telling it, I'm actually tired. I'm actually, I'm, I, I, I'm like, I made it through. It's like, okay, we start now. Boom, boom, boogity, 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 boogity bang. Oh. And that's because all my stories aren't paced like that. Nope. You've heard, but that particular one is paced like that. Each story has inherently within it a pace or timing, a sequence, boom, boom, boom. And then when you get to that thing and you things are happening to the character fast, you have to brute, pick up your pace, you know? And I, I love stories like that, but they're exhausting and they take time and patience, you know? Oh. This dog. Okay. Uh, it'll be on my YouTube page. The cat story. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, Donna, what is in, in that watermelon story? 
to me the is the exaggeration part we should see is that the the size of the watermelon or is that the actual moving down the 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 highway um you know could if you if the watermelon wasn't so big no one could be inside it of course but i mean where where when you're thinking of that story and when you're imagining that story you're thinking all of that is happening for you and your story where is the hyperbole where is the exaggeration that you want to accent all right it builds larry actually it begins with the size of the watermelon and in, in imagining my stepmother being able to actually step inside of it and then it's starting to roll and taking out the corn and taking out the fence posts and so it it literally builds until it gets to the highway and then we're knocking things off the highway and mowing down mailboxes and Burma shave signs and you can always tell the age of the crowd if anybody laughs at the Burma shave signs because a lot of people don't know about Burma shave signs. Uh, and so it's sort of, I guess, you, you know, every story has an arc, every, narr every narrative has an arc that builds to some sort of climax, we usually call it, before it begins to resolve itself. So I guess what I would say in answer to your question is that it starts to build in, in the field, and then it reaches a kind of climax at the point we're going down the highway and then it right there where it way. makes that curve yeah and then it hits prairie dog town and begins to to slow back down right that's uh and and the pace i know that the pace that you tell that story at seems to be consistent the entire way and you're using the words and the phrases to to bring out that that hyperbole and that exaggeration rather than you becoming frenetic as you're telling it. I mean, with, a lot of times we see people doing those and, and they're trying to get excitement across and they're doing it with their body rather than, than with their body maybe and the words that they're bringing apart. It's, uh, uh, that, that's a, probably my favorite of, of the, the lies that you tell uh, because of the way that just visually, I just track that whole thing in my brain every time. It's a, it's crazy. <laughs> so, so we're we're moving. We we we're funneling into these in in, in a way that uh, we didn't plan, but it's worked out well. And that is, if we move to number six, which is honor the lessons of good uh, performing and keep them always, this ties back into um, it, whether your voice, your facial expressions, your gestures um, all have uh, a part in, in your conveying that, that story. Uh, so, uh, and that, that's one of, the, one of the criteria, remember, is presentation presentation skills. So that's all part of it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So what do we want to add? Anything to that? Um, I think if we, if, if we would add something about the, the lessons of good performing, I think a lot of times, uh, if, especially if you're on a stage doing this, you have to be aware of those microphone skills mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and the way that that microphone, I know we've seen a few folks do in their stories and and a part of their tale has to be uh we step off to the side and do something else and you can't forget that the focus needs to be you know three to four inches from that microphone and you you're going to have your attention spread across the room all those things you already know to do but when you're performing a story like this maybe there's some humor that's built into the story and you want to either either laugh with the audience or don't laugh with the audience let the audience get the things that are happening but but you want to be consistent with those things throughout the the presentation uh, mm -hmm. sometimes these lies can be a little tough to to get through anything you create yourself i guess can be a little tough to get through you you want to make a change to it or something in in stream and um i i think number six just really 
the, you've got to approach this story the same way, the same reverence you would with any other kind of story that you're going to tell and just just be a good, interesting presenter, I suppose. I don't know, DC, what's your secret for 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 getting your frame of mind around? I've got to be up here on the stage and tell this particular story a particular way. OK. Um... When I tell a story, I'm very selfish. And it's got to be exciting for me. It's got, it's got certain stories bring a certain adrenaline rush. Like that story we were talking about earlier about the pace of that story. And that story, it really has nothing more than entertainment value. Like you said, once you look at it, but then when you look at how it's done, you know, but then you turn around. So for me, the stories I tell, oftentimes I will tell a funny story or a lie to lighten up sometimes some of the heavy stuff I'm doing. You know, because believe it or not, I actually had a, I had a librarian tell me this once. She said, DC, we want you to come to our school for Black History Month and tell stories about slavery. Make it fun. <laughs> oh, and I'm, I'm telling the truth. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth. So, but what I had to stop and think about was like, okay, what is she asking me? What is she really asking me? She wants, you know, she wants the knowledge given, but she wants it given in a certain way. And a lot of times it's humor that will allow you to cross that bridge. And for me, I always try to find out, I want everybody to leave the storytelling session feeling good. I don't want them to leave confused. I don't want them to leave bored. So I want them to, humor is very cathartic. Uh, I may be using the wrong word, but it is kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I can laugh, it's okay to see the humor in some of these things, you know? And for me, that's what works. I've got to be able to, I got to feel the story kind of in, in my gut for lack of a better term, you know? And the, the reasoning I tell these stories a lot of times, sometimes I have my story divided. This is just for entertainment. This is to inform, enlighten and entertain. Those are three things I want to accomplish. I want to inform, enlighten, and entertain. Sometimes I can do it all in one story. Sometimes this story is just for information. This story is just for enlightenment. And this story is just to entertain. So once I put them in the categories, each one brings with it its own reward emotionally for me. Now, does your, does your, own, does your own countenance, does your own posture your own your own physical nature change between those different types when you're performing yes yes it does because it's actually necessary a lot of times if you're just entertaining you've got to be open you've got to make yourself open accessible if i'm telling a story that's kind of heavy okay um i tell the story of Emmett Till. And in the telling of the story of Emmett Till, there are parts of the story where my demeanor has to change because now I'm telling something and I want you to remember this. Now, in the story of Emmett Till, what I want the young people to remember is that not the atrocity that happened, but what happened to change people as the dominoes began to fall behind that. That's more important than the atrocity because you want to leave people with, you want them to feel good. You want, you, 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 as a storyteller, I feel like, okay, when you leave, come, when you leave listening to DC tell stories, you know what, I feel good, I'm all right. I got a smile on my face, my heart is a little lighter. And sometimes, I think we all do that. All storytellers do that because this is not just something that 
every storyteller I've met is never wants to, I've met very few that came and said, well, you know what, when I graduated high school, I had my mind made up, I'm going to be a storyteller. No, there are things that happen in life that put you in that direction, put you in that place. And therefore, what you have to say was ordained. It was, it was foretold. You, you just got to go out there and say it. And I try to be authoritarian when I'm talking to the kids in my college class because millennials got issues. <laughs> now, now, Donna uh, Washington asked, you said that you're you you were selfish. Um, what what did you mean by when when you're when you're telling you're 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 selfish? Oh, okay. When I'm putting the stories together, first off, the stories I've got to like them. I got to like them. I got to want to tell this story. I've got to have a sense of purpose for why this story works. Because if I don't believe that, and I don't really believe in myself and what I'm getting trying to get accomplished, I'll step on the stage and the audience will look right through me. I don't know about the rest of the audiences, but in the hood, you don't go up there shaking and faking. They're gonna look right through you. They'll look right through you, you know? And I, I, I just grew up like that. And so I have to really believe that what I'm saying and go to the wall for it, you know? And uh, that's really important. In all storytelling, not just what we're talking about today, but in all storytelling, because right now I'm putting together a story about women's suffrage. I want to talk about women's suffrage because I was reading a book on, uh, oh my God, what's her name? She's got the money named after her. Y'all know who I'm talking about. But what, I, what really was very unusual about the story were the names that began to pop up. And then I started Googling the names. And believe it or not, in the fight for women's suffrage, that was really the first time that Black people and white people actually came together with like-minded purposes. And it was the women. It was the women. Sojourner Truth is there. Uh, Frederick Douglass actually worked with the females in the suffrage movement. And there were other women that you wouldn't know if I named them, but I fell in love with that story because the, the message in that story is that, hey, we can get along and we can get this done. And the idea of having a plethora of cultures and people in that story is really important to me because I think that that's something, you know, I think all stories have, a, all storytellers have a soapbox. They might not admit it, and they might keep it to themselves, but our stories, storytellers have a soapbox. And sometimes that's it's standing on that soapbox that motivates you to get out there and tell stories. Like I never thought, well, the scariest stories I told, people tell me all the time that uh, I really love that story. And it was when I stepped up on the stage at Tay House and I told the story of the Watts ride. No one would ever believe, how do you tell a story? about a riot. But I felt that what was going on in America at that time, uh, it was an apropos story because I want this information to get out. And I said, well, you know what? I'm gonna go up here, win, lose, or draw. I'm telling this story. One time I was getting ready to tell a story and Donna introduced me and I, I stopped at the top of the stage, at the middle of the stage and I looked at Donna and I said, Donna, this is the biggest moment in my life. And here I am fixing to try something stupid. She may not remember that, but I remember telling her that before I stepped up there and I took my chances. So sometimes when you get telling stories as a storyteller, you have to make those decisions. And when you make those decisions, you got to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you ain't got a chance. Forgive me for stepping on my soapbox. That's all right. I, I think uh, well said, and, and you were answering a question about what you meant by selfish. Uh, and, uh, and to get us back to the lying scheme of things, uh, this kind of goes back to, uh, well, having fun with a story. I remember you said, DC, that don't forget, well, and that's one of our, one of our uh, uh, commandments is that, you know, don't murder the fun. So if you can't, like a story, enjoy a story, 
And if it's not fun for you, then it's not going to be fun for, for anybody else. Uh, I have uh, by piecemeal uh, typed in the, the commandments which were drafted for us by the right Reverend Larry P. Thompson, who is, I believe, a preacher's kid. Uh, and uh, for sure, there you go. And we decided to just adopt them as our as our our guides uh, because they all encompass exactly what we need to be talking about. And somebody made the statement that uh, actually numbers six through nine actually are actually they apply to any kind of storytelling. And yeah, we don't have real num we don't have commandment number ten. Uh, so you've got them all. No. Uh, well, it was either uh, it was either stop at nine, and and be uh, be emblematic there of of Monty Python, or go to eleven. Right. You know, right. because the list went to eleven to be more emblematic of Spinal Tap. So I just I just rolled back to number nine instead. This list goes to eleven, uh, but and that makes it better than any list that goes only to ten. But um, uh, it. This one, number seven here about truthfulness, I think uh, that it, to me, that's always the place that I, I want to be uh, easiest to, to uh, if, if I'm going to win a contest with all these rules, no, number seven is the one I'm definitely going to, going to win with because you, you got to have that that truthfulness on through and and i guess that would deviate from any other story that i tell uh, if i'm telling a a completely random uh piece of of texas lore I, i'm i'm following that structure of texas lore but if i'm telling a, a line like this on purpose then i really need to stick number seven that that keeping that air of truthfulness is and you, you guys saw that in the watermelon story. You, there, when you see Donna tell that story up on stage, there is no one more truth filled that day than, than her. And, and it's just the matter of fact way she is going to tell you how this thing happened. And you're going to believe it. it it's, it's crazy. Somebody asked in the, in the, the chat, if, if, uh, I feel qualified to speak on this point. If you had a second place story, do you keep on telling that second place story or do you improve it to a winner? Thank you very much for pointing out my weaknesses for the entire crowd. Uh, but, but really, uh, I guess I would say a little from column A and a little from column B, a story that you create yourself is always up for uh, up for improvements and embellishments as you learn and see uh, new things in the world. But but you really can't, so, so much of winning and not winning comes down to the particular judges that day and maybe what position you're in. When you go to a contest and they draw numbers, we all will just lament, oh no, I'm number one. I'm going to lose for sure because they're gonna not going to want to score mine really well in case Donna has something really spectacular and we both got all tens. That can't be, but you can't, I'm going to approach each contest. Like I'm building a winning story every single time you, you never shoot for second place, but the judges or the crowd reaction may drop you down a couple notches. And then you just listen to, the reactions you get at different places in the story, and maybe you want to you want to tweak that a little bit next time to to stretch out that distance between uh, audience reactions. Um, mm -hmm. You can shorten length in different places like that. Uh, but I don't know, Donna. What would you say about that? If you can, you can you take a second place tale and turn it into a first place tale. And you can take a yeah, you can take a losing tail and turn it into a first place tail. I uh, I told a, uh, I have a story called Lost in Cyberspace. It's all about yep problems that people my age have with computers. Uh, and I um, I took it I think first sort of out of town tryout to uh, 
to the Houston Liars contest. And I didn't even place. And I thought, well, how about that? Uh, although one of the judges later told me that he couldn't, he, he couldn't score me well because it was the truth. It wasn't a lie. And there is a lot of truth to it about our, my husband and I and our inabilities to deal with computers. But then, and so I did, I did, I tweaked it a little bit, not much. Uh, and uh, I think, I think it finally won at the state contest. So yeah, you can, uh, <laughs> and it, and it sometimes helps to do the out of town tryout. You can tell it to a guild, you can tell it to uh, any group of people. I, I used to do a lot of programs for uh, Road Scholar which is used to be elder hostel and then went through and, and these were adult audiences. And so I would try out uh, my whatever wild lie I was working on and, and see if they laughed in the places that I thought they should and, uh, and, and get ideas back from sometimes you just think of something in the moment and you add it. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And um, so um yeah, you're right. Somebody just said, Bill left point said, all judging is subjective, and that's the gospel truth. I've actually tried judging one time, and I don't ever, ever, ever no. want to no. do it no. again. Uh, okay, Katie was asking how, what's the difference between refining a lie as opposed to refining a personal tale or folktale? I don't know that there would be any real difference. Uh, well, I could, I, I'd like to add something there. All right, I wish you would. When you're, when you're refining a lie, one of the things that you add to that is humor. A lot of times when right. you're yeah. finding a story or a personal story, it's not always funny. It's, you have them. I just recently wrote one about my first kiss, and I'm going to challenge everybody to do that. If you're in this workshop right now, I want you to think about your first kiss and how good you were at it. <laughs> okay, how good you were at it. And so the only difference is the addition of humor. Now, if you start a personal story and you know it's a funny personal story, then the humor is, comes natural. But oftentimes when you're doing this, it is something that has to be refined. You know, so there's two different, you have two different goals. A goal in humor is just to entertain, but a goal in the personal story can be defined by the situation, how you're telling the story and the purpose of the story. Is the purpose story to teach? Is the purpose story to motivate? Is the purpose of the story to uh, console? But I think I think what you just said there is is the way to, to answer Katie to say, does this particular story have a goal in mind? Did I reach that goal? And if I didn't, then it needs to be tweaked. And yes. what are some possibilities for tweaking? So in a in a in a lie that may be humorous, uh, if you didn't get laughs where you thought you should, or you didn't get enough. Or, or the pacing was wrong. Those are tweaks for that. If you're telling a folk tale and, and the people are falling asleep, well, that's a different kind of tweaking, but it definitely is still tweaking that you've got to do that story. So put a goal for your story and then did you achieve your goal? And if not, then you're going to need to make adjustments to that story until it does uh, reach whatever the goal is you had in mind. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question about does a lie always have to be funny, especially for contests, my immediate reaction would be yes, just because that's, I've ne I don't think I've ever been involved in a, in a, a liar's contest, at least in Texas, uh, in which there were any serious stories to I mean the, the part of the audience reaction I think that is measured is how much laughter right. and entertainment value right so uh, at least for my experience the answer would be yes uh, now I have a story 
Well, and you guys have both heard it, it's the story of Little Red. Little Red the Rooster. And in the story Little Red the Rooster, it's a story and it's, it's about a lie. The little boy kills the rooster. He hides the rooster from Big Mama because that's Big Mama's favorite rooster. He hides the rooster, but his little sister sees him. And they, she kind of co-signs his lie that he don't know what happened to Little Red. But she also blackmails him by saying, well, you know what? He, he promises her that he'll do whatever she wants as long as he promises not to tell Big Mom. And the rest of the story is about how he has to live with the repercussions of his life because there's a part in the story where uh, Big Mama wants to take them all to eat some ice cream. And she looks, he looks, and she looks at him and she looks at Big Mama. She says, Big Mama, little brother told me he didn't want no ice cream and I could eat his ice cream all up by myself. And he, he looks at his sister and his sister looks at him and goes, and he realized he can't tell the truth. So that's a story where the lie is it's, it's, it's not really, it's a funny story because of the sister dragging him through the mud. But the story is about the repercussions of a lie on him. So a lot of times the story don't have to be a lie, it can be built around what are the repercussions of a lie and how people get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into a bad situation because they can't tell the truth. And those are the ones that I see, and uh, that's a story about a lie. So all stories that can be told in a lies contest don't necessarily have to be a quote, quote, lie. They can be about a lie. And also they can be surrounding, you're, you're the truth seller in a situation where everybody else is believing the wrong thing. So I just thought that that might, answer your question or give you or let you expand on a, the scope of your question. But uh, most people come to a lies contest because lies contests have a history of being notoriously funny. And uh, that that's the entertainment value they're looking for. Yep. That's the entertainment value they're looking for. They, didn't, they don't come to the lies contest to hear the story of uh, Abraham Lincoln and Gettysburg. They don't. They, they, they come to hear the story about a damn cat, you know. <laughs> well, it, you know, Donna, you mentioned that we, I think it was maybe in Bernie last year this, that one of the fellows told a really fantastic story and it was a personal story. And, and it was a good personal story about a guy, a, sort of the crazy guy in his neighborhood. Um, but it, it was a good story constructed. It was a well-constructed story. It had all the points that were needed. He did a good job delivering the story, but it really fell flat from a judging liar's contest point of view. He needs to tell that story as a personal story and, and, and tell it over and over again. It had a great point, but it really fell flat did. against the other stories that were delivered and, yeah. and so i mean it i don't guess it has to be i i don't suppose there's a rule that says it has to be funny but but like dc says when those crowds are gathered for a liar's contest they expect to be entertained in that fashion <laughs> um, mm -hmm. if and and, and and is it via via good via good, good. She's, yeah she said uh, that that gentleman missed number five hyperbole exaggeration and 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 that's a true fact and that's a lot of the place where your your humor is going to come from but and then Vivica says when you're developing stories what factors come into play in your decision about keeping a personal story as a personal story or embellishing a personal story into a lie mm -hmm. and I mean I think from what DC said, it, it follows that same thing. What's going to be the goal for this story? Are you going to 
be relating something that happened with your family and your goal is to enrich and and inform and educate or is your goal simply to entertain and once you cross that threshold to simply be entertaining embellishment locations will appear and and you know it's turkey dinner on the table when but you know my sister one time we were cooking it was the easter dinner and it was ham and and my mother had baked a loaf of bread actually baked an entire loaf of bread and when my my sister got the loaf of bread out of the oven and popped it onto the to the cutting board to begin to cut it it skittered off the cutting board and hit the floor and my father ever the 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 wit that he was he said well just pick it up and wash it off and we'll keep eating it well it's a loaf of bread you can't wash it off what but it i could have if i'm only going to talk about thanksgiving memories and 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 have a have a, a meaningful conversation and a story about Thanksgiving, I will leave that part out about it falling on the floor because my mother break, baking a loaf of bread, that was something that needed a, a parade and, and some sort of award to come out. She did not bake. Uh, but when I want to embellish it into entertainment, then that bread hitting the floor is a detail that I definitely include. It happened both times, but I leave it out when I'm when I want to have a different kind of influence come from that story. Not sure if that answers the question or not, but you're you're kind of shaking your head, but maybe you're not quite shaking your head. To me? <laughs> no, Viveka, no, I, she's, she's okay, on the, I think it's Viveka, is that right? Are we Viveka? mispronouncing See, it? I always say Viveka, Viveka. I know. Well, we Man. want to do it her way. In general, do very physical stories seem to work well? Ooh, I got a thing on that one. Go ahead, you first, Larry. Nope, nope, go for it. Well, uh, oh wait, wait. The adult ahead. is our adult is is going to interject. Do you want to? Are we taking questions too early? Well, that, we we are at that point when we said we would, but we haven't actually. Uh, we've sort of mentioned "Thou shalt not murder the fun." when we were talking about uh, do the stories, do lies generally need to be funny? And I think that's part of it. I know the two kinds of concerts that uh, will attract the most people at a festival generally are the Liars Contest and ghost stories. And those are particular kinds of stories and the audience comes with a, with a particular set of expectations, I think. Um, but, but, but number nine, lest we forget here is makest thou not to live in excess of the time rule. Now this is just related to contests. Most contests will limit the time to somewhere between eight and 10 minutes. If you go over that time, they don't come with a hook and jerk you off to my knowledge, but, th but you begin to get uh, uh, points taken away on the scoring sheet. So, it is wise for those who are going to compete to figure out <clears throat> how, how to time yourself and to allow for, for the laughs, if you're expecting to get laughs at a certain place. What, what I've discovered, because I write my stories uh, before I tell them, and I have figured out that each double space 12 point type page that I have will take me about two minutes to, to say, to tell. So any lie that I write for a competition is gonna run three and a half typed pages. And that's, that should get me to about seven minutes, allowing for any pauses and uh, any laughs and whatever. That was for an eight minute story. I could stretch it maybe to, for, but anyway, so there's that works for me. It also is a good idea, of course, to time it uh, as you are preparing for uh, for competition. Um, and I had a friend who did that by setting the timer on her oven or something and seeing if she could beat it. 
you know, get get to the end of her story before the timer went off at 10 minutes or eight minutes or whatever it was. So do you guys have a method for staying within have, time limits? I use my, my father's method. He, he used a jawbreaker. He would tuck a jawbreaker into his chin whenever he began the sermon. And when the jawbreaker had, had eroded, you know, and, and melted away, then it was time for the benediction and head home. Uh, there was at one time when he used a marble instead, and we were in church for the whole day. But but the time, I, I, th I like what you said about typing those things out and, and his particular delivery along that line. But so much of that comes back to pace, mm -hmm. as, as yeah. DC mentioned, because if it's, if it's a super fast paced story, you know, you're going to have 10, 12 pages of, of text, but uh, I'd be curious, DC, do you have your text of the stories uh, actually written out? I'll write a text of the story, but that's just step one. The text of the story, I'll write. Then I will write what looks like an outline, but it really is, to me, it's a skeleton. And then I will hang bits and pieces of skeleton. Well, I'll tell you what, a Christmas tree would be a better example for most people. That, imagine the tree and then on the tree are pieces of fruit. Okay, to get to the top of the tree, if I'm telling the story and it's under eight minutes, I can only get two or three pieces off the fruit. But if I've got 10 minutes, I can get four, maybe five. So, Way I do it is I'll put the story together, I'll write it out, then I will draw my skeleton, and on the skeleton I'll say, well, you know what? I need to make sure I hit this point and I hit this point, but if I got time, I can go hit, 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 hit. But a lot of times I might not have the two or three items I can hit before my time is up. But you start at the bottom, and then you work your way to the top, and that way as you begin to pick, you end up picking, you still stay in sequence. And it allows you the flexibility to tell the same story in 12 minutes that you would tell in six. Yep. And that's that's how I do it. And it works for me because sometimes if you also one of the things I love is having the clock in front of me. Mm -hmm. Because if the clock is in front of me, and I'm telling the story and I'm looking and I'll be like, oh my God, I've spent two whole minutes setting up the story and I wanna to get to the meat and potatoes. So if I do that, now I know I've got to change my pace. My pace has got to move up and then I can actually accelerate my pace and then slow back down near the end when I want them to get the play and the language. Like in the example of my first kiss. In my first kiss, I, I, she held my hand, and then just as I was getting ready to leave, James was sitting out in the front of the car, and he was blowing the car. James is my cousin, you know, he's my cousin, and he's much older, and he's real cool. He's a player. And so he had to blow in the car, and just as I got to the gate, she turned around, and she kissed me. I floated to the car, and we got in the car, and James looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? I say, I kissed the girl. Really? You kissed the girl? What happened? She kissed me on my lip and she put her tongue in my mouth. He said, that's a French kiss. I say, ooh wee, and I didn't even know she was European. So, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, six stories, the six <laughs> But like I say, so much of that is true, but I use the play on words. I used to play on words and it was kind of like, okay, no, he didn't. But before I built my character up to where I was the, well, at that time, I really had never kissed a girl, you know, but you know how us men are, we would never admit we never kissed a girl. If one of the fellas would come along and say, oh man, what's up? Oh man, I know what I'm doing. I'm blah, 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 blah. And then the girl kissed me and scares me to death. So obviously you have that juxtaposition, that juxtaposition. And so that was fun. And that's fun for me. That's fun for me. I, I love taking the ride on the storytelling tree. And that's me. I build my tree. And so, like I say, 
different pieces of fruit, but all each one of the pieces of fruit will come from a different level until I get to the payoff, which is the tippity tip top. And that's how I do mine. Okay, I, I just put my email in the chat if anybody uh, wants to. I don't know whether I, I don't, <clears throat> somebody else gonna have, have to help me solve the technical issues. Uh, Joyce later suggested I could maybe send the Bill Lip uh, article out because it is, Katie says it's not available. Anything uh, before 2012 is not available in the story uh, telling of the magazine's archives. So I don't know whether I can do that or not, but, uh, but I'm offering my email if those of you who would like for me to try it, yeah. I could Joyce scan it and email it. So I'm I'm putting um, my email in so you can get oh well except I guess it would help if I would send it, wouldn't it? There it is. Um, <laughs> see, I, I tell you, I'm I'm handicapped when it comes to technology. Okay, so we are at a point where we have like 10 minutes, I think. Uh, we've been trying to read, and if we've missed some of your questions in the chats. I guess uh, the, the thing to do would be to remind us of what you uh, would, what question you had if we didn't get to it uh, and, to, and to continue to, uh, to uh, or I don't know, I suppose you could uh, unmute one at a time and uh, ask a question in your actual real voice if you want to. Uh, you've, uh, Or raise the hand. Oh, I forgot about that part. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's we a can watch for the thing. raised hands. Katie had a question about physical humor uh, quite a while back in the chat, if she still has it. Okay. Phys physical humor. Um, I guess uh, to, to what end, I guess, or what? What, what additional, because I mean, on the one hand, all, all humor is physical, but uh, Katie, what maybe more specifically were you thinking of with the, with the physical nature of humor? Well, I'm just thinking like, like based on the stories that you were telling, it seems like it wouldn't be great to go to a liar's contest with a story about like an interpersonal conversation or something like that. Like these things where, you know, there's a person inside a watermelon, she's rolling down a hill. She, like, so, so what's happening to you is actually a physical thing versus mm -hmm. maybe, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess that's true, but, but even, even DC's story with the cat, it, it's as much of that story's humor comes from the conversations that he has with his wife wanting to keep the cat and the cat of course doesn't speak and yet he wants him to tell him how to get home so i mean there's another nuance to that but but um i i guess what i what i would say from my point of view is do the kind of humor and the kind of story that you're most comfortable with so if you happen to be most comfortable with, you know, creating these grand scenarios and the watermelon is rolling and you can vividly put that out to people, that's what you're going to want to go for. But if you're more, you're more physically reserved person yourself, then, then your story probably is going to be more physically reserved as well. That's the one you're going to be most comfortable telling, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd ever thought about this, Katie, but a lot of my early stories, and maybe that's because I did start off with the folk tale motifs, because the one that I wrote right after the watermelon story was also based on, I think, from that same book about the Ozark. It was about a turkey that was pulling a boat. And I injected my, my uh, uncle, who was a hunter and fisherman, into the story and had a turkey... He won a turkey in a, in the turkey shoot, and he was it was a live turkey. He was taken home, and it was already tied up, had his feet tied together. But he tied an anchor rope on it, and then he's going to take it across the lake in the boat. And 
the turkey gets bored with the whole thing and wants to go find some place to roost. And and even though he's hobbled, he manages to f- start flying. Anchor catches the boat and pulls it down Lake Travis, basically outside of Austin. So it was very vis- very visual, very physical. And I think um, I sort of picked up on that pattern there for a while because I've got a story about my son and his wife winning the horse race in Siena when we went on a trip to Italy and a lot of visual stuff, a lot of physical stuff, uh, a lot of movement. And I think a lot of times in liar in lies, there's a kind of journey, you know, the journey motif is in a lot of stories and, and that would be true with DC story about the cat and all that other stuff. So I think you pick up on a lot of those same motifs that are in any kind of story and in just enlarge on them. Um, uh, so, yeah, and I thought you were asking about being physical as part of your performance art. And again, the only one that I've seen do much of that was this Dennis Gaines, who was a big, long, tall cowboy anyway, but he he acted out his stories oftentimes. And I saw Bill Lepp one time, who was supposed to tell a ghost story, and he didn't really have a ghost story, so he made up a lie. But at the end of it, he literally fell down on the stage as part of the, so it was very physical. I remember he said, that hurt. Um, <laughs> So I suppose you can do that too. Uh, uh, good questions, things for us to think about, as well as whatever we've been able to throw out. Well, um, let me get you since then. What the humor? For me, the physical humor is if it's nature, if if if, if it's natural to the character. Yeah. He spoke of my story of Walker, Texas Ranger. When I do the story of Walker, Texas Ranger, when I turn and I say, I turn and I look and Walker looked at me like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when I jump up, I jump up and I take the typical exposure of a guy that's overacted. Watch out, Ranger Walker. And when I say that, the audience just goes nuts because they've all seen this idiot. They've all seen him somewhere. And so the physical humor sometimes is actually a part of your physical, of the character. Your character must be three dimensional, okay? If your character, if you paint your character as three dimensional, let him be three dimensional. I really only had two characters in that story, me and Walker or Chuck Norris. And so, like I say, he was just this intense, intense type person. And I was just like, <laughs> and so that was me. And then uh, sometimes the story, the physical can be a caricature. I do a story about the uh, changing the collection plate. And I say, sister looks so good, stood up. And when she stood up, she got a chance to sing her favorite solo. Yeah, that's it. I want to walk and talk to Jesus each and every day. I want to feel my life an example to him for every way. I want to hug him and squeeze him and please him. <laughs> and the deacons all got up, started throwing money like they did when she danced at the Hoochie Coochie Bar down in Lubbock, Texas. So, <laughs> but each of the characters, she was the physical character. And the deacon, when he got down to pray, he put his hand like this. He was praying. And the preacher, he grabbed the pew. <clears throat> and see, those were, that made my characters three-dimensional. So physical humor is sometimes not about making the kids laugh with a pratfall. It's defining the physical, the three dimensions mm-hmm. of the character. That's how I <laughs> All right, you got your hand up, Larry. I think. Oh no, it's just it's just resting here on the top of the the chair behind me. It's all, and it just happens to be in the view of the camera. Senior Winces, Senior Winces over here on the side. Oh, oh, Gigi! <laughs> shut the door. Yeah, shut the door. Is yeah, Joyce is here. 
George is reminding us that uh, there are, there are other liars tales other than other liars contests other than than the ones we were talking about in Texas. So motels is uh, if we if we'll email Joyce, she'll give us the information. Uh, All right. Yeah, there's some wonderful. OK, that's a good. Uh, Heather is saying that if you compare somebody like Bobby Norfolk, who is very physical on stage with Janice Del Negro, who is pretty much a straight up tell tell the story and don't get in the way of it. Um, so uh, we're we're at the end of our uh, appointed uh, time, uh, but to we're the, told his raised hand to high. High five. She's she's got a question. But we're Rebecca. told that we, it's not a problem if we need to go longer. So okay. Rebecca has a question. All right. Good. Yes, I have two questions actually. Um, how well does dry or dark humor go over? That's question number one. I uh I, I tend to that's more my natural thing. Um where I mean, I can find humor in just about everything. I I mean, I've been at wakes that I've had to leave the room because I was so tickled by something that, you know, I, <laughs> I was about to disrupt the service, you know, that kind of thing. So that's question number one. And then question number two is, uh, can a story be personal? You tell it sometimes as a personal story only, and you also tell it as a liar story when, you know, the opportunity presents itself. Can 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 a story exist in two dimensions? Okay. Yeah. Yes, it can. I, I have an example of that. Although for me it didn't work out very well. Uh, we were we went to France uh, in 2018, and I was the navigator, which was a the wrong thing to do because I don't know much about navigating any more than I know about technology. And so we managed to get lost twice uh, when we were in France. One in the garden at Versailles, you'd think you could get back to the palace from the garden, but we managed to miss the bus back to the, to the boat we were on. Anyway, and so I, I thought, I sort of likened it to, um, to the, story, the classical mythical story of the labyrinth. And I played with it and I was pretty happy with it. And I, uh, and I to took it to a liar's contest and it, uh, I think I placed, but I certainly didn't win. And then I thought, well, maybe I should just tell it as a personal story, uh, but I haven't done that yet. I mean, I'm gonna have to kind of rework it. So I think the problem for me anyway, sometimes is if you tell a personal story as is, then it's harder to exaggerate. I mean, you know, you're you're too stuck to the truth, uh, and so it helps if you can get out of that mold and and let yourself play with the personal story. Certainly, but just to tell it straight didn't work very well for me, for whatever that's worth. So maybe a funny story doesn't necessarily have to become a lie. Oh no! Is that okay? Heaven. Okay. True. Because I, I'm, I'm asking because there's some, there's something that happened to me. True, true story. Um, uh, you know, has to do with the surgery that I mentioned to you when we were before we came on stage. Well, anesthesia, I guess, was still in play, and some things got really, <laughs> uh, kind of went in a in a funny direction. Uh, but you know, I see opportunity to share it as just a person as a personal funny story mm -hmm. but i also see opportunity to like really exaggerate it and mm -hmm. it become this other thing and so just trying to get some insight from you all do i let it exist in both worlds or do yeah. i yeah definitely. okay definitely okay yes and you, okay. you also mentioned dark humor too and so i mean that's probably coming from from that place with the the anesthesia but i mean i have a couple of <laughs> stories that that would would probably involve maybe uh, maybe dark humor or not. Uh, you know, certainly self-effacing is is yeah. always a fantastic inclusion in a lie like that. But if you can paint that picture, uh, you know, some gallows humor or dark humor could could certainly fall within 
uh, yeah. you know, within a good life. Yeah. An definitely. example of what I mean by dark humor is my family is usually the ones that I guess kind of think is funny. I'm and I'm actually sometimes not trying to even be funny. But let's just say our daughter or son comes in and they're like, mommy, you know, this something happened. Somebody was doing something really silly and and died as a result of it. And I just with a blank face say they won't do that again. Well, you yeah, know, and then exactly. yeah. well, <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> and they'll just look at me like, I can't believe that's you that's just that's said that. That's 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 that old adage. Is you know you're hanging out with the wrong crowd and one of your best friends last words to you was, Hey, watch this. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I hold my beer. I heard I heard this the other day and I'm I'm I've got to put it in somewhere. The 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 lady went to the to to church's chicken drive through and, and made her, her order, you know, she needed uh legs and thighs and, and the woman on the microphone said what which side and she said well right i guess or left i don't think it makes much difference <laughs> and she of course meant do you mean mashed potatoes or fries but she said which side and and so you know I've, things like that you just you got to keep a hold of you know hold my beer that's that's what happens whenever the weather in texas you know uh, the Lord says it's going to rain today. It's going to snow today. This evening, it's going to be 70 degrees. You know, this could never happen at one day of time. And, and Texas says, hold my beer. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> you just watch. But I think dark, yeah, dark humor is, is certainly, it kind of, it might depend on the crowd, I suppose, that you're, mm -hmm. I, I find that the things that I specifically create for a liar's contest become adult audience stories versus kid audience stories just the some of the concepts you talk about and some of the fast moving language that kind of thing but but sure i wouldn't have a problem with dark humor i'll i'll laugh unfortunately that's yeah any humor, any humor is good it's the delivery practice your delivery practice your delivery yes practice your yes delivery. yes and oh, if, they, if they don't laugh, okay, just move on to the next phase. Yep. On to the next phase. Because I found out that I like to go to odd, what you would say, storytelling venues. I will actually go to an open mic comedy night at a comedy show just to hear and watch them. And then I'll actually tell them, I say, well, you know what? I'm a storyteller and I need more than, you know, two and two and a half, three minutes. And they'll say, well, will you come up at intermission? I say, sure. And I'll get up there and I'll do my thing. And I actually started doing that because of the college kids. I teach at the college. And they would be like, I'd have class and they'd be like, Mr. DC, tell us one of them funny stories. And I would tell them, and they say, you ought to do that, you know, come on up. And I came up and I enjoyed it. But it was, I also learned something. So visit other venues, watch other artists, how they perform. And if you watch how comedians perform, you'll see that they, you know, uh, it's the delivery. You'll have the same comedian tell two different types of stories, but because of his delivery, you know. So practice your delivery when it comes to that dark humor, practice it. You'd be surprised how many people actually get it. I find people have certain things that, you know, that satirical type wit will go over their head, but they'll get dark humor, you know? And I'm like, okay. So you just have to kind of uh, practice for your audience, practice for your audience. You know, and like Larry said, a lot of your dark humor eventually become adult stories. You know, they become adult stories. Your physical humor is for your children's stories. You know, it's for your children's stories. They want to see you stand there and, you know, do the physical stuff. They like that. They like the movement. They replicate it. They love that. And uh, as you move up the age ladder, the uh, physical stuff just becomes not as important in entertaining the audience, but as important in character development. 
Well, did did you see our, our resident NASA scientist has popped in with a question? Judy Alton sitting right down there at the bottom. Hi, Judy. How are you doing? She ha she's one of the people who happens to have some of the the missing moon rocks uh, that they brought back from one of them Apollo missions. Nobody uh -huh. can track them down. Judy's got them at her house. That's what that's what I understand. But she says, is it possible to share factual information through a liar's tale as entertainment? Will the listener mistake what is true versus what is a lie? Um, I would probably say just turn on some news broadcasts over the last uh, seven or eight months and you will have your answer. Uh, that, but, but they're not very, they're not entertaining. I don't know. I think you would go back to the thing that DC said earlier about having uh, a, a story within a story that lies within the story that's there. So you could make a fantastic story about some of the things that have been proven incorrect by science. Those, those would make fantastic stories. Uh, but your story coming off this like Donna said, people that have an expectation that what they're going to hear is completely false. So you'd probably want to avoid those factual things in that story. But creating a story about uh, science, everybody, we all have to do STEM these days and talk about STEM, where your story fits in with STEM. Uh, that, that'd be a fine thing to do. The, stories from the, the moon expeditions and they find this, 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 and this, which are true, but they also found this thing, which wasn't true, but could have been true and could have been on the surface of the moon. I'd, I'd, I'd listen to that story all day, especially when you tell it, Judy. <laughs> we, uh, I was gonna mention one more thing. If we had added a, a 10th commandment, uh, that, and I think Larry and DC have both addressed this uh, in our discussions, uh, is always be working on a lie, right? you know, or, or freshening up a lie. Uh, so we were even gonna talk about what we were working on, but I think we've kind of exhausted our, our time, but <clears throat> it, it helps in a workshop like this or with like-minded people or even on email or whatever to, to share ideas with one another about what you're working on. And um, I've, I've, I usually try out stories <clears throat> in progress with friends of mine who are uh, willing to listen. And I almost always I get uh, ideas and um, or figure that something's not going to work uh, that's helpful. So, um, yeah. Uh, I've been a little lax lately. I need to. I need to be thinking about a new lie. Okay, have we worn everybody out? You've well, been Rebecca. wonderful, all of you. Huh? I just added one more question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do lies work well as oh. tandem tales? I I was just sitting here brainstorming. I would think it it could, but it would have to be some some quick thinkers, I guess. Um, doing it well there are some there are some folk tales that would probably equate with lies that i've heard told in tandem that old good news bad news uh lie well story okay. but it could be a lie so yeah it's i think i think uh tandem tales require a lot of uh, of work on that on that presentation part um, yeah, yeah, order. I can see that. Yeah. I was just actually what triggered the thought was when Larry mentioned the moon rocks and and I could see how the next teller would pick that up and say moon moonwalk, the, you know, and they just change it like totally from what the first person said and tell a whole tale about something that Michael Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. And then that would just segue and, you know, it just continue on into something else. Uh. Well, be fun to try. Oftentimes, the story is a tandem. T if I was going to write a lie, it was a tandem tale. It would be two two people both telling what they see as the truth. They both see it as the truth, and 
I told a story once about me running through the park in Austin. <laughs> now I remember that. I'm running, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm running through the park in Austin. And the lady in front of me, all she sees is this big black guy chasing her through the street. I'm thinking, I'm chasing her because, boy, she really looks good in that jogging suit. So we both are running, but we both have two different things going on. And I tell it from one point of view, but I could see that as a tandem tale where she's saying, well, I was coming by and I was just walking out. And all of a sudden this black guy started chasing me. Oh man, he was running so fast. Because when she started running faster, I started running faster. And then she picked out a cell phone. And when she picked up a cell phone, I thought she was calling me. Yeah. So it got crazy. But uh, yeah, it's just creative dialogue. Creative dialogue. But the easiest to do would be to tell the same story from two different points of view. And the relationship of the two people telling is very key to that working as well. If a husband and a wife are talking about a disaster or something that happened in the house, Larry's gonna see it from a completely different viewpoint than his wife. Donna's gonna see a completely viewpoint, different viewpoint from Jerry. But they both could be right. And I think that would be the fun part is at the end, they both find out they're right. You know, that's the way I would write it if I was writing it. But, you know, I would actually love to just hear something. I bet right now they're both thinking about something that I'm talking about. <laughs> that it happens, you know? No, no. Oh, well, he, Larry would never admit it. But yeah, because it happens, it happens to all married couples. Well, I thought you meant so-and-so. So, so. Well, I said so-and-so. So. Yeah, but I thought you meant. And you often run. So tandem tales can work. It just takes a little bit more work. And I believe the key to a good tandem tale is the relationship of the two people telling. You know, what is their relationship? Why are they both talking about this one incident? Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think this was most fun I've had in a long time. <laughs> I believe you. And, and again, we do what some of the people, uh, Bernadette just mentioned this too. Uh, certainly the, the attendees have been aware of the uh, wonderful contributions of all the tech support. And, <laughs> and believe me, we wouldn't be here without them. Uh, or I wouldn't, for sure. So uh, our thanks to them and our thanks to all of you who tuned in and especially to those of you who followed up and filled out uh, the brief little evaluation form that will help us out with some uh, uh, grant writing and what have you. Uh, so uh, unless we have further questions or comments from any of you or from the other two guys, I guess we're about ready to wrap this thing up, but keep on telling. Definitely. Love, peace, and hair grease, baby. <laughs> oh.